All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome to this week in Missouri politics on a very busy week on the Missouri political landscape. And we are excited, and I'm personally thrilled to be joined by the president of the Missouri Senate, uh, Senator Tom Dempsey. Senator, welcome, Mr. President. I should say welcome, right? Good to be here. Um, I always thought president of the Senate was an interesting uh, thing because really it can go crazy in a heartbeat, right? I mean, you could be the president of the Senate, but they all feel like they're independent senators, right? Right. Well, I always refer to myself as first among equals. First among equals, nice. So being first among equals, uh, this week you talked about the uh, state budget and the, and the budget the Senate crafted. Can you give us the cliff notes of what the Senate position is and the lump sum budgeting? And you made a little news yesterday about that. Yeah, I, uh, in my press availability yesterday, I um, stated uh, something that I had told Kurt on Monday, and that was that I, I was not going to support a conference committee report that included lump sum budgeting. If it, if it came back to the Senate that way. And, um, you know, also talked about how, listen, I, I appreciate what, what Senator Schaefer's trying to do. Um, he's, he's trying to rein in spending in welfare and social services. It's the fastest growing part of our budget. Um, but I just felt that if you don't have someone in the governor's office that's gonna be a partner in that, then what you're likely to see um, is, um, harmful cuts to the people that we care about and, and do want to serve instead of trimming you know the some of the agency spending and the FTEs that the employees spend. It seems like sometimes when there's budget cuts the agencies cut the person answering the phone or they cut the the things the public's gonna see to make it look as bad as it can look outside of that but they don't get some of the core spending but if you don't outside of Senator Schaefer's way how do you rein that spending in? Is it just you have to elect a governor that wants to? Is that the only way to do it? Well, we're going to make sure that we have a balanced budget and we're going to, you know, they need to justify before the Appropriations Committee how they're getting their spending. And, um, yeah, I do think at the end of the day, you need a governor that's going to make those changes. I mean, in reality, we agree with 95 percent of the governor's budget generally, and we mm -hmm. argue over the other 5 percent. And so to really get the type of change that Senator Schaefer is looking for, you need to have an, a chief executive that, that wants to reform government. It would, it would seem, though, is you put more money in education in the Senate budget. It would seem to me like that would be what the public wants, is they would prefer some of the social spending be constricted to prioritize education. It is hard that they don't vote that way for governor, though. It seems like a seems like an anomaly where I think he's trying to cut government and maybe focus priorities, but it, the House seems opposed to it. So you think it doesn't come out in a lump sum form? What I stated was this is my position. You know, I you know, hadn't pulled the caucus on it. Um, it's something that I felt strongly about. I had communicated to Kurt on Monday. Um, uh, to my staff, I said, if anyone calls, this is my position. Had talked to uh, representatives with the nursing home industry, with uh, the uh, service providers, the d disability service providers, and the mental health disability, or excuse me, mental health providers in St. Charles County. I said, this is where I am. And so, you know, that I was getting the word out there Monday through Thursday, and then Thursday I just told the press and sure. widened the distribution a little bit. Uh, another issue court reform. Uh, the House's position is a little different from the Senate's. How do you see court reform? What do you want to see in the court reform bill? I haven't read the House's changes. Certainly um, was very pleased with the 34-0 vote we had on Senator Schmidt's bill. Um, I think uh, from a, a couple of conversations with Speaker Deal, I, I like some of his ideas. And I think, 
you know, a melding of the two, taking a few of their ideas. Um, you know, if we need to raise the cap a little bit, I think we're doing that for some of the outstate members who don't that, see the problems is, that we wants, have. Who wants these speed traps? It's very hard to identify who wants to just harass citizens. Who is in favor? <laughs> well, they don't want to see this. The, the, you know, they don't come out and tell you we support speed traps. <laughs> you know, what, what they say is, well, we don't have the abuse that they have in North St. Louis County. But if it's a statistical thing, the stats would show if you don't have the abuse, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I listen, I supported the, I actually sponsored two years ago the, the latest revision to Max Creek downward, you know, and, and I had to compromise it you know, by 5%, and that was to get it to 30, you know, and so <laughs> Eric wants to bring it from 30 to 10%, and, um, you know, see what happens at the end of the day. I, we're going to have a reduction, and, yeah. you know, it ultimately gets to how, how these cities are uh, raising revenue, provide services for their citizens, and what you're seeing, I kind of talked about this on the floor, is a movement away from things like property tax, where the people in the community are paying for the services, to um, other mechanisms where it's like, let's get the money from people who live outside of our city. Don't tax me, tax the man behind that tree, right? Right, right. let's tax the, the rental car person or the, <laughs> the person staying in the hotel or the sales tech, the person who's, you know, living in the unincorporated er area that shops at the grocery mm -hmm. store or, you know, well, or, or, the, uh, or the person coming it. down the highway passing through. There's nothing stopping these cities from instead of just harassing and cite, citing people to raise it and say, we provide this service, it costs this much, will you pay this much for this service? Nothing right. stopping them from doing that, right? Right, if you wanted greater police protection, sure. then, then make a case to the citizens uh, that you represent that it's a priority and we should pay for it. I think they're afraid the citizens maybe feel like they're governed plenty and might not want that much. Yeah, and, I, and uh, I, I think the state legislature, I think we've enabled them to the point sure. where, you know, Ideally, we wouldn't need a court reform bill if they were taking the steps that they needed to take locally. I mean, they're capable of doing all the things that are in our bill themselves. Um, and a number of the tools that they've uh, abused have been provided by the legislature. When you talk about red light cameras and, and uh, or speed cameras, and, and uh, we haven't restricted them from doing mm -hmm. that. And, uh, so it'll, it, it's a priority, and uh, I'm hopeful that the House can move on the Senate bill such that we can get it to conference and, and uh, you know, have it not get caught up in any last-second you know, sure. controversy. Um, speaking of controversy, uh, you've said you'll put right to work on the calendar at the end and of the next week. week. Um, how do you see that? Is this, it seems like a bill that if PQ'd would in, effectively in session, um, probably doesn't get to a vote without a PQ. How do you see that going down? Well, um, you know, for the first time ever, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how important right to work is uh, for Missouri's business climate. And, you know, for the first time in history, one of the legislative bodies actually passed a right to work bill, and, and the House did that. Um, and so I, I think you've got a lot of people outside of the chamber and you've got, uh, certainly I have members that care very much about right to work that would like to get the bill to a vote. And, the, you know, PQ is the, the, the short term for shutting off debate in the Senate. It's only been done a handful of times in the history of the Missouri Senate, so it's rare. And in my experience and the times that you've seen it, not much gets done afterward. Like in veto session, I think the consensus was you were pushed into that. That was one, probably not a failure of the Senate. It might even been a failure of other members. Um, but would you feel like it um, would be an unfitting part of the way you've tried to govern the Senate if you have to have a PQ? Well, I, you know, the moving for the previous question is part of our rules. You know, and I, I've always said, listen, I'm not against ever doing uh, having a PQ motion because I think if you, if you say that, then as a majority party and particularly it's going to be those issues that get PQ'd mm -hmm. are the ones that the majority party cares about. You've already negotiated away some of your position before you ever sit down to the table. Um, so, you know, I, it's not impossible that, you, 
that that we would do one and uh, you know we had the one on the 72 hour waiting period sure. that was during veto session there was there was no way to amend the bill it was part of a deal that you'd made in good faith and kept right yeah the, well it was one that the republican caucus yeah. agreed to and um you know everyone knew that we were going to lose a vote that david pierce was going to be leaving and so you know we really had no other choice but to get the get, Can you get to, to our Senate. viewers um, does a PQ pass I mean it's got to be voted on it's got to have 18 votes does it pass the Senate well it takes five members to put one forward and uh, I'll say for that reason I think um, there's a there's a strong probability that we will have a PQ vote and you know, as I look at our Senate roster I think it's going to be a close vote if you're holding the gavel when that vote goes down no matter what issue it is, do you feel a little bad for the Senate if it passes? Um, you know, I, I just I know how strongly people feel about the issue. So, and uh, both in leadership in the House and in leadership in the Senate, I said I wouldn't I wouldn't be an obstacle to getting it to the floor. Um, but I've also said, listen, if if you want right to work, and and you look at the experience in the states that have have adopted right to work in the last few years in every case it's been with a republican governor mm -hmm. and uh... so this bill passes the governor almost certainly vetoes it there's no way to override it is there i i don't see how you get there and and that's where i guess i fall is that listen if we're gonna have potentially we're gonna um, make the we're gonna blow up the senate um, we're going to get everybody on the record, which is what a lot of people want to see done. Um, I'd like to see a policy change. Sure. You know, that you actually you accomplish something. It's not just a theoretical thing. It's a practical adjustment to Missouri law. Right. On to something lighter, the Rams. Uh, they got a proposal <laughs> they're doing now. Um, uh, I guess we're sending it to the NFL first. Uh, how's that going to strike you? It, it, will, the, will the state be a part of keeping the Rams? Um, you know, I've not talk to anyone um, involved in the process that has asked us to do anything uh, legislatively. Uh, we did pass by amendment uh, Senator Silvey's um, legislation to require a vote. You know, the governor's talked about that, or his administration said they have the ability to, I guess, um, uh, renegotiate or, or um, Refinance the the bonds and use that revenue stream mm -hmm. for uh, you know this new stadium idea. Um, his legislation would call for a vote if the governor wanted to do that. Um, All things considered, the Rams the Rams here in two years are they gone? Uh, I think they're gone. I think if you look at all the actions by their owner. Yeah. And I would say the things that he hasn't said, which he's not, made, he's not made any overture that he wants to be here. Will it be wrong to blame the state if the Rams, I mean, it's in the owner's decision to leave. I mean, it, I think the blame may be placed other places as Dan Crockett is not going to care. But it seems like he's the one to blame, right? I mean, he wants to move his team. I think That's I, his decision. I mean, I think the, what, second wealthiest owner in the NFL <laughs> wants to be in a much bigger market than the St. Louis market. Um, on to 2016, the Republican field seems to be getting more crowded for governor. What's your take on it? Well, you know, I, I wish we could have, you know, a candidate such that we're, we didn't uh, waste a lot of Republican resources trying to figure out who our candidate's going to be, but we're past that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I announced my support for Catherine Hannaway earlier. Early, I. She did a fast, fantastic job as the Speaker of the House. When you take the majority for the first time in 50 years, when you, um, you know, what it took in time and organization to make that happen. And, um, you know, it was a difference of 2,000 votes across the state of Missouri determined the difference between us being in the majority and continuing to be in the minority. And so, and, and for her effort, you know, I got to become a chairman, and um, and we did some good work under her, and um, 
So I, I support her, but that's not taking any away from the other candidates that are there. I think we have some very talented people that want to be governor, and uh, I'm just hopeful at the other, at the end of the day that whoever we select, that we come together as a party and do everything we can to to make that person successful in November. During your time in service, you saw Republicans be very unsuccessful in, at governor's races. When you look at Catherine, there's obviously the issue of what what the issues surrounding um, the death of Tom Schweik. Um, I guess the question a lot of people ask is, can she move on from that? I mean, can she move on and have a competitive campaign? Is that an issue that's going to dog her, and can she win? Um, although no one's made an accusation to her, I want to be clear. What, can she move past that? No, it's, that's tough. It's a good question. Um, and I think it remains to be seen whether she'll be able to move on from it or not. And um, well, My last question for you is, situation. you'll leave state government Right now, probably is the most respected term limits era legislator. Are you going to run for anything else? Is <laughs> who are you? Who, who's telling you? I talked to your scared. wife, and she was, okay. she was very <laughs> steadfast in, in that opinion. Yes. Um, what are your plans for 2016? Um, I haven't made my plans for for 2016. Um, my focus has been on this this legislative session and doing what we need to do in my capacity for us to be successful and. And I, I've looked at this summer as a time for me to start thinking about what uh, what will I be doing beyond 2016. Well, I hope to have you back before Labor Day then to see what those plans are. Well, we'll see what happens. Senator, thank certainly, you very much. Certainly love to come back on. Appreciate you having you. Thanks, Scott. And we'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Welcome back. We are joined by now by our Opinion Maker panel, including for the first time on the show, Mark Dalton, the Assistant Political Director of the Carpenters Union, Representative Robert Corneo of St. Charles County out near where Senator Dempsey's from, and I should add, a legislative softball champion this week. Congratulations on your victory. Three times. Three, Pete. Yeah. Megan Shackelford uh, in the final four now of the Barclays Cup. Also, when she's not running for a nerd political uh, internet <laughs> contest, she's with the Kelly Group and uh, Show Me Victories. And lastly, we have Scott Dickhouse, uh, sadly eliminated from the Barclays Cup. Now he can get back to his job <laughs> as running HRCC with his history-making majorities and winning every race in the lost world. Lost to a house guy. That's okay. Lost well, to you a house lost guy. to yeah. Okay, so it's all in, it's all in the family there. That that's right. Um, speaking of the senator, uh, you've served in state government while the senator has. What do you think of his interview? I, I'm always impressed by Senator Dempsey. He's uh, he's one of the most level-headed political figures in the state of Missouri. I think he's respected by everyone. He's, uh, he's one of those guys who's just not a, a bomb thrower. He goes about his business. He really thinks about things. He tries to do the right thing. Uh, and I think his interview was just indicative of his whole career to this point. Um, you know, nothing uh, agitating in his interview, nothing uh, aggressive, but uh, I think well thought out positions. And I look forward to uh, his decision as to what he decides to do for 2016 and beyond. Megan Shackelford, there's one part in there that was interesting when he talked about the PQ in the Senate. A man that served the state, as he has, incredibly respected, I'm sure he doesn't want to have a PQ. Do you think there's a, be a little bit of regret holding that gavel if that vote comes out to blow up the Senate? I think it was clear in his interview that he is very analytical and he wants to see things get done, which I, as a Democrat, respect a ton because we don't have many people like that on his side of the aisle all the time. And so I think it's great that he wants to see things happen for the state and not stop, you know, movement. Mark Dalton, you had to be listening particularly closely to that part of the interview. What do yes, you sir. think? Uh, I, I agree. It, uh, like Senator Dempsey said, it will uh, blow up the Senate if they do PQ. It, uh, it tends to bring things to a screeching halt. And uh, to 
to PQ something that several, many people see uh, not becoming a law in the end, um, what is the necessity to PQ and slow everything else down? Uh, Let me ask you, you're one of the most politically savvy unions in the entire state. Is there, is there the votes to, to actually pass that? They have the votes to pass it, to, to override a veto. Uh, if the governor vetoes, uh, we don't see that. Uh, I don't think even many of the legislators see that. And uh, again, to PQ something that you know, uh, you're confident that is not gonna get overridden, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't make the best political sense. And uh, you know, we've seen in the House there's bipartisan opposition, or actually tripartisan, with an independent voting against <laughs> it. So um, it's not a party issue. Uh, we don't feel, we feel it's, you know, it, it affects everyone. So we've never, we haven't seen a caucus take a stance on it. Representative Cordejo, you are from St. Charles County, probably know Tom better than anybody. What'd you think? Yeah, you know, I echo what Scott said, you know, he's a true statesman, uh, as level-headed as can be. Uh, he's my senator and I personally respect him, thank the world of him, and I think it's gonna be real exciting to see what, what lies in his future. Uh, with, all the, with all the issues surrounding the end of this session, it's probably good to have somebody like Tom in charge. Absolutely. Like I said, you know, he's pretty level-headed. Uh, he makes great decisions. Uh, you know, you don't move all the way through the House, become floor leader in the House, and then move over to the Senate and continue a great run uh, without being well thought out. So, uh, speaking of, the governor's got a lot of praise this week, uh, appointing Nicole Galloway to fulfill the term of Tom Schweik. Megan Sheckover, you personally know Nicole Galloway. Tell the rest of us what she's like. You know, I think she's gonna be a great state auditor. Everybody who's paid attention to Boone County knows she's had a lot of success as treasurer there. Um, I, she has a really great background outside of politics, auditing, and being budget-minded, and I think that she's going to be a very a bipartisan type of state auditor and that you've seen this week she's gotten a lot of support from her other elected officials just saying she's very conscientious very thoughtful reaching out to other people and really just starting out on the right foot can I think she's she win an be, off your election in the state of Missouri I absolutely think she can I mean she's had success in Boone County which I think is a great place to start out if you have further statewide ambition she's committed to come on the show later this month so it'll be interesting for all our viewers yeah. to get to know her too um, Scott Diggs, this, this came off looking good, right? I mean, well, I think uh, I, I don't think most people are paying attention. I think it's one of those things yeah. that you know, uh, auditor is kind of one of those positions that people don't pay a whole lot of attention to. And I think you know, unfortunately, it's gotten more attention uh, recently mm -hmm. than it probably ever has before. I think it was um, telling that uh, you know, five, six months ago, the Democrats didn't have anybody that wanted to be auditor in the state of Missouri. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't put anybody, any serious candidates on the ballot. Um, the people of Missouri spoke. They said they wanted a Republican to check the Democrat administration and to keep an eye on the Democrat administration. And I think what we have here is Governor Nixon you know, appointing a fox to guard the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, and I don't know that it was really a, a great move for the people of Missouri. Representative Cornejo, let's let's change this to Governor Cornejo. Clint's wife will leaves office. Do you appoint a Democrat? You know that that's a great question. Uh. <laughs> Tell me he's not thought about it. Seriously, I mean, is is that argument? I mean, would would you expect any other any of the people running for governor now to take a statewide office and not appoint someone of their party? No, not at all. Uh, you know, getting back to it, I think. If we, knowing that he was going to appoint probably a Democrat uh, from the Republican Party, that's probably the best Democrat he can appoint because she hasn't run a real campaign. You know, she was appointed in 2011, she ran unopposed in 2012, and now she's appointed statewide. Um, if I'm a Republican, I'm I'd take a look at that race in 20 coming up in 2018 because she's never run a campaign. Who who do you uh, 20? Just give us a little peek into who you think. Uh, I honestly would it be have, a Speaker Todd Richardson looking into that? Who would it be? You know, that, that's a very distinct possibility considering uh, uh, Todd Richardson turns out in 2018. He's very well respected. He's starting to build up a statewide base, and I think that would be a very good spot for him. Mark Dalton, the Carpenters Union is one that is not a foregone conclusion of supporting a Democrat. Correct. Extremely politically savvy. Is this the kind of uh, candidate you could support in 2018? Uh, we are, uh, like you said, we are not a partisan organization, we're a labor organization. We look at uh, a few of our core issues, uh, right to work, prevailing wage, uh, being a couple of those. And we we support both sides of the aisle, um, even independent. the kind of person that could win your support, though? 
Uh, could being uh, it, we we look at the labor record uh, if they've got a good labor voting record uh, things that we look at then uh, we have no problem supporting candidates like that. Again, that may be one advantage. She doesn't have a voting record. Right, it could be an advantage, and I think it's you know early for people to count her out that she had just because she hasn't had to run a statewide mm -hmm. campaign that she wouldn't be able to run a very successful statewide campaign. What I like about Nicole more than anything is that she's young, she's a fresh face, she's not somebody that we're all used to seeing run for different offices and try for statewide. So I think that we're going to see a very bright future from her. On to uh, more immediate issues, 2016, Robert Cornejo, um, are you going to join the ever-expanding field for governor, as we foreshadowed? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I have no plans on that. So you're but, the one that's out. <laughs> exactly. But like you mentioned earlier, you know, the field is ever-expanding. I think by the end of the month, possibly uh, Senator Parson may throw his name into the sure. arena. And you know, with all these St. Louis area folks like uh, Bruner, um, Hannaway, and also uh, Greitens, all being from the St. Louis area, I think out state person like Senator Parson from the Southwest area, he's going to have a legitimate shot. Scott, what about Peter Kinder? I mean, you know this state as well as anybody. Sure. If Peter Kinder's in this race, some argue he might not be able to get 51 percent, but could Peter Kinder win a five-way race? Peter Kinder's proven that he can win any type of race, head-to-head, cool. -head, you know, with a Democrat in a primary. Uh, Peter is a very, very savvy politician, and I think he's well-respected. Um, you know, I think if Peter got into the race, the race changes quite a bit. Uh, I think you're looking at a field of, you know, five, six candidates potentially right now. And uh, I think that that number could shrink before we're actually casting sure. our votes for primary. Megan Shackelford, um, of these folks, we have a sheriff, we have a SEAL, a, a veteran, John Bruner, former speaker, female candidate that some argue would match up well. Which one does Chris Coster not want to see? You know, I think at this point, he really could run a great race against any of them. Um, I think that he's going to have, you know, a challenge with anybody who's maybe from more of his base, the St. Louis area. But I think that this race is going to be very interesting for the primary, no matter what we do, because you see people who are going to tick off a certain sect of the Republican Party. So I think at this point, especially if Peter Kinder gets in, it's anybody's race. I personally would love see, to see Peter run for governor. Well, how many folks run for governor on the Republican side at the end of the day? It get, it's five talked about now. I don't know. At, at this rate, it's like rabbits. There may be a dozen. You never know. You never know. <laughs> um, quick hits. Who wins that primary out of those five? If all five are in, who's, who's got the f advantage? I think if Kinder gets in, Kinder wins. They can out of those five. Quick hit. Who's? Completely agree with Kinder. Scott Dickhouse of the five? I, I'd probably give the advantage to Kinder or Bruner. It just depends on how it all pans out. Hmm. Representative Cordell, who's the, who's the favorite? I'd go with either Kinder or Parsons. Pretty close. I think Parsons is the name people are not talking about. Yes. From southwest Missouri, while Chris Koch is all prosecutor, no politics, uh, Senator Parsons is actually Sheriff Parson. Yes. Could be all sheriff, no politics. Yep. Be quite an interesting, uh, interesting <laughs> dynamic to see the two of them. You couldn't find more different personalities and styles going in. That might be an interesting governor's race. Absolutely. I think whatever it is, is going to be interesting. One of the most interesting ones in a long time. Absolutely. You know, uh, Senator Parson kind of got his name with the right to farm on the ballot mm -hmm. last year. Uh, he was able to run around the state, build up a great bash, grassroots uh, base, and you know, with being with the right to farm, he also got to know Lu Lucas Oil, uh, Forrest Lucas, sure. pr pretty well. Um, so you know, I think if he needs some cash infusion, he can get some, and he's got the grassroots base. He's going to be tough. Be interesting. And uh, lastly, before we go, we want to remind everyone on Twitter, hashtag Barclage Cup, dollar goes to the Missouri Epilepsy Foundation. Tremendous charity, and we thank Dave Smith, Dave uh, Spence, and Astrid for doing that. And we'll see you next week.